right, the uh, discussant mix is almost complete. That was an exciting market to watch. Maybe we can finish uh, the matching mechanism at the next break. So we're going to do this, uh, this paper presentation now. And, um, and then there'll be a break, and then there'll be office hours, and then there will be the dinner. Uh, so the idea here with my presenting this paper is to model a presentation, to model discussion, what Jess is going to do. But you all are welcome also to chime in and to ask questions. And you should be consuming this on one or two levels. If you're interested in the topic, consume it on the level of substance. I think it's an interesting paper. Maybe you will too. Uh, this is actually the first time I have given a full-length presentation of this paper. Uh, so it's, it is the paper I am presently giving most often. I have given it in 30-minute or 20-minute sessions four times, so the infomercial version. But this is the first long version. Uh, so comments are very useful, and part of why I picked it was because I wanted comments from Jess. Uh, she has had the paper, I don't know if you looked at it, but you've had the paper. Um, yeah, so this is on teacher effectiveness. This is an education paper in a developing country context. We recently changed the title. You can tell me at the break if you like the title or not. Implicit in the title, Teacher Effectiveness in Africa, is an external validity claim that I am not going to do much to justify today. So that is one comment that you could make or think about is how come, given that what you're going to do is look at the effect of teachers in one part of one country, namely northern Uganda, are you claiming that you're looking at teacher effectiveness in all of Africa? And Africa is a big heterogeneous place. All right. Where do co-authors come from? So Rebecca Thornton, there should be an N in there. And, uh, let's see what you learn. Uh, was my junior colleague at Michigan. She was hired the year I was the associate chair for recruiting. And um, she is now at Illinois. We co advised Jason Kerwin, so our third co author. Uh, he is now at Minnesota Applied Economics. And Julie Bull Wiggers is a Danish person who responded to a call for volunteers at a seminar. So Jason presented one of the papers from this project in a seminar at Minnesota and said, we have all these data. Is anybody interested in helping us look at it? And she raised her hand. And I would never get a co-author that way. <laughs> I think that is completely insane. But Jason and Rebecca routinely get co-authors that way. And Julie has turned out to be fantastic. So in this case, it worked out really well. I should mention, too, that the data underlying this paper come from a large project involving a randomized controlled trial that I will be telling you about. That project was designed, designed and implemented by Jason and Rebecca. They have both been to Uganda multiple times. I have not been to Uganda. I sort of came in late into this project. And so there may be questions that you ask having to do with the details of the project or the details of northern Uganda where I have to just write them down and say, I'll go ask Jason and Rebecca. Uh, that's, at some point, I will go to northern Uganda. I haven't done it yet. And, but for now, I'm learning about it indirectly through them. Also missing an end here. This is pretty bad. So how did this paper come about? I talked earlier today about where the papers come from. When we were both at Michigan, Rebecca was telling me about this project in its early days. And I asked, are you randomly assigning the students to the teachers? So the intervention that we're going to study is randomly assigned to schools. So my question was about what's happening inside the school. Are the teachers, are the students within the school, all the schools had to have at least two classrooms in each grade that was being treated are the students being randomly assigned to the teachers. Because as I will describe, that's important for what we want to do. And her answer was, no, should I be? And I said, yes, you should. And so it was. And so we have a paper. So papers come from all kinds of places. How did this come about? 
I knew the literature on value-added models. That's what we're going to be discussing. We're going to be discussing the estimation of individual teacher effectiveness, of a coefficient for each teacher, and how much they add to the test scores of students. I knew that literature a bit from my consulting practice, from writing tenure letters for people who write papers about value added, um, from refereeing papers about value added. Rebecca was new to the education literature. She didn't know about this literature. And so by coming together and exchanging ideas, we were able to augment their study in a way that allowed us to generate this paper. Jeff? Yes. So before you go on, as an example, when you give a presentation, there's something here that I want you to remember to do, which is that if it's a co-authored paper, acknowledge the co-authors. It's really bad form to leave them off the title slide. And as you become more senior, it's, it is generous but also expected that you mention where your junior co-authors are and that you try to explain their role in the project briefly. So you should do that. And don't, don't give the impression that something was solo authored if it's not. What you should not do as a young person giving a seminar is spend a lot of time on the intellectual history of the paper. Uh, you should just get into the paper because you don't want to get bogged down. When, so later on, it can be useful for people to understand where the paper came from. Part of what Jeff is doing is, is for your benefit teaching you where papers come from. But when you think about how to give a presentation, mention your co-authors and then move in immediately to the substance. Exactly. These two slides, where do papers come from and where do co-authors come from, are specific to our purpose here. Right? They're non-standard. As They weren't as, in my outline. Exactly. <laughs> and that's verboten. <laughs> OK, so motivation, right? That's supposed to come next uh, in the outline. So I'm going to give uh, two slides of motivation because I think there are two aspects of this paper that need to be motivated. The first is value-added models. Now, if I was presenting in an education seminar, I could presume that everybody knew what a value-added model is. As we learned earlier today, when you introduced yourself, Many of you are doing human capital related things. Maybe you have heard of this literature, but many of you are not. If you're a trade economist or becoming a trade economist, you've probably never heard of this literature. So I want to motivate it. Teacher value added. So BAM stands for value added model, right? And out of the value added model come estimates for individual teachers of how much they increase student test scores on average. I'll put up the equation for that shortly in the slides. Why might we care about that? Well, we might want to target interventions to weak teachers. We might want to reward, financially or otherwise, strong teachers. So in the United States, in a lot of jurisdictions, there has been an emphasis on estimating teacher value added and then rewarding teachers who do well on that metric. Now, these are estimates and so teachers complain that they're partly being rewarded or punished for the sampling variation. Indeed they are, but no performance measure is perfect. If Eric Hanischek was here, a well-known education researcher at Stanford, he argues that we should cull the lowest tail of value added each year. Just get rid of the teachers, the one or two percent with the lowest value added estimates. Send them off to do something else. Fire them. Fire them, yes. Let them go. Lay them off. Um, help them find a profession to which they are better matched. And replace them with new draws from the urn. And his argument is, and he does this quantitatively, that if the U.S. did this systematically, based on the best estimates in the literature, GDP would increase by hundreds of billions of dollars, with a B, right? Just by replacing bad teachers with new teachers. Uh, you can like that or not, but that is a motivation for looking at the distribution of value-added measures. All these things are going to be more or less important depending on how variable 
the teacher value added turns out to be. And that's going to be our focus today. If teachers are very heterogeneous in their value added, then there's a lot of value to getting rid of the worst ones or rewarding the best ones or targeting interventions. If all the teachers are about the same in their value added, then none of this stuff makes much sense. Right? If the worst teacher is only marginally worse than the best teacher, why fire them? Right? That's costly. Um, also relevant are discussions of the effects of schools on inequality. If teachers are very heterogeneous in their effects on students, then they may be promoting inequality relative to a situation where teachers are relatively homogeneous, and so on and so forth. So you know, there's another reason in developing countries that we might care about both the level <coughs> and the variance of value added which is that teachers are one input into the education production function, but there are also other inputs, so textbooks, supplies, mm -hmm. uh, I, things like just infrastructure for the school, and understanding how important teachers are in the production of knowledge lets us think about how devoting resources towards hiring and recruiting teachers versus other inputs in the education production function. And I think that's actually a little bit specific to developing countries where we're really thinking about that margin of trade-offs. So technically you could uh, uh, collect and compare all the different variables and their value added to the education in developing countries and see which to put your, your uh, infrastructure or yeah. Yes. If teachers were very heterogeneous in their value added, and you had some way of picking out the high value added ones by spending effort, then Jess's question would be, OK, that costs money, right? Money put into the hiring process to sort the good teachers from the bad. If you're going to spend that money, that takes money away from slates and clocks and other goodies that you might put into the schools, girls' restrooms, all that good stuff. Okay, so my second motivation slide is about Africa. So why do this? There's a giant value-added literature in the US. There is a modest but growing value-added literature in Europe. There is a very small literature on value-added models for developing countries. So I believe that is the universe of papers that estimate value-added models using developing country data. So we are one of six. We are the first estimates of teacher value added for Africa. So this is our hook for trying to get into a top journal. Right? We'll see how that works. Uh, but who cares? Right? What if we were the first people to estimate value added models for bumblefuck, as you uh, <laughs> said yesterday? Uh, you know, for Rhode Island or Iowa or something like that. Why should you care? Why is it interesting to have the first value added estimates for Africa? Um, I would say that there are two reasons, at least. Maybe you can give me some more. One is, uh, there's reasons to think that value added, the variance of teacher value added might be different in Africa or Uganda in particular than elsewhere. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Whereas, if I already have value-added estimates for Nebraska, I might not think that the, my value-added estimates for Kansas, which is next door in the US, are going to look very different. There's reasons, I think, to think that the variance of teacher value added might be much larger in Africa, in developing countries in general, than in developed countries like the US. Yeah, I guess pretty. Okay. There. But also, the returns to education are quite different in developing and developed countries. And there's a kind of an updated version of the, uh, so there's a, a relatively new paper that came out of the World Bank that just runs Minzer regressions. Um, and how much we care, so value added is measuring how much teachers increase test scores, right? But 
what we really care about is how much test scores affect welfare, by which as economists we typically mean income. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so wages are life in, support covered. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> the return to education is different in different parts of the world. And so that's another reason that we might care about specifically understanding the value added, uh, how much test scores increase in different parts of the world, because test score increases translate into different levels of wage increases. OK, I like that. Uh, I should mention, by the way, so we will reference the estimates from these three papers later on. I haven't actually read these two yet. Um, these two papers are not going to be random assignment of students to teachers. This paper is. One of the et al. here is my student, Ijenu, by the way. So that is, that is an IDB enterprise. OK, so what's the basic idea? We're going to estimate teacher value added in northern Uganda. Now, the reason that there have not been a lot of papers in developing country contexts that estimate value added models has to do with a lack of data. So to estimate these models, you need to have data that matches teachers to students over time. Even in the US, these data have been publicly available, publicly available to researchers only for the last 20 years or so, and only in a small number of states until recently. And if you don't have data like that, you can't estimate these models. You need students linked to teachers with multiple tests, you know, one at the beginning and end of the year, or one at the beginning of each year, over time. Uganda doesn't have that in general. Most African countries don't have that kind of administrative data. The reason we have it for Uganda is because of this evaluation, right? So we're free riding in some sense. Uh, I guess it's not free riding since my co-authors are getting the evaluation paper done too. We are piggybacking, let us say, on this evaluation which collected data for its own purposes that link teachers to students to test scores with tests that are given repeatedly over time. I would just be careful not to go too far in that claim because in most African countries, there are primary school leaving exams and secondary school leaving exams, and, we, and there are administrative records of those. And then there are separately administrative records from schools that yeah. link teachers to students. Now, the, the students are not randomized, and there's a lot of selective attrition between primary and secondary school. So they're not ideal, but it is not impossible to estimate value added using administrative data. That was not my sense for Uganda from my co authors, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so it is possible that it is very hard to obtain the records from the schools, yes. but they are supposed to exist. Okay. All right. So, in theory. Yeah. Okay. Certainly in Kenya. Okay. You could probably do this. I would believe there are some places where you can yeah. do this. All right. So there's a, there's a paper idea again, right? Find another country that has these data and you can do this. We're going to worry, as this literature does, about the sorting of teachers to schools and the sorting of students to teachers, right? I already hinted at the second one of these. If students are assigned to teachers in a way that students who would do better anyway, whose test scores would grow more anyway, are assigned to certain teachers rather than others, then our estimates of value added are going to pick up the sorting and not the value added of the teacher. Right? And it's that problem that students may be assigned to teachers non-randomly in ways that are correlated with what their test score growth would be anyway, that the random assignment of students to teachers is going to solve. Right? No selection. Now, there is an issue in the sense that if what we care about is the distribution of teacher value added as schools normally operate, and what we're getting is the distribution of teacher value added in a world where students are randomly assigned to teachers, which is not how schools usually operate, then 
we're sort of looking where the light is, right? We're estimating this other object that's well identified and that may or may not be closely related to the thing that we might actually want. But that's a trade-off we're going to make. And we're going to have school cross years where random assignment happens, and we're going to have school cross years where random assignment doesn't happen. And I'm going to show you distributions of value added for both of those so that you can get a sense of how important this non-random sorting of students to teachers is. We are going to do another thing that the US literature does, which is we're going to look at the correlation between our estimates of teacher value added and observed characteristics of the teachers. Now, if we could find four or five observed characteristics of teachers that were highly predictive of value added, then it would be very easy to selectively hire good teachers. So we'll see how that pans out. We are going to correlate teacher value added to teacher classroom behavior. Right? So we had people, enumerators, everyone's an enumerator for some reason in Africa, uh, sit down in chosen 10 minute blocks in these classes and code up the teacher's behavior. Right? This is a common thing in the education literature in the developed world where now it's, there's a big project funded by the Gates Foundation, for example, to put cameras in classrooms and record classes that people could then code up in any way they want using whatever rubric they have in mind. The Department of Education also has a separate related project like that. So this is a little mini version of this. And we're going to see if teacher value added correlates with Notice I'm being very careful here not to talk about causality. I'm talking about correlation. Correlates with these teacher behaviors. I'm a little unsure still what to make of these. Uh, we'll say a bit more of that when we get there in the talk. That's something more feedback would be useful. And finally, and this is a very novel aspect of the paper, right? So this is the second thing that we think might help our journal placement as being kind of interesting and new is that we're going to estimate the impact of this intervention, which I'm going to tell you about, the NULP, the Northern Uganda Literacy Project, on the distribution of teacher value added. Right? To my knowledge, this is not something that's been done before in the literature, and it's going to turn out to be kind of interesting with some caveats. Okay. I'm told it's important to have research questions, and the questions consist of a sentence with a question mark at the end. So here is my slide with such questions. What is the distribution of value added among teachers in Northern Uganda? How important is the sorting of students to teachers? Do te estimates of teacher value added correlate with observed teacher characteristics? Do estimates of teacher value added correlate with aspects of the classroom behavior of teachers? And how does the intervention affect the distribution of teacher value added? So there you go. We've got five research questions. That's a lot for one paper. Uh, but I think they fit together in a nice way. And none of them takes a vast amount of time to answer. So here's some institutes, here's some contextual background. I think I'm supposed to be doing the data now. but. I'm going to give you some contextual background. Um, Northern Uganda is a relatively poor part of a relatively poor country. And we have, as I mentioned, we have videos of these classes. In we have videos of classes in addition to the coded up 10 minute segments. I have watched some of these videos. Um, you know, Uganda was run by the Brits for a while. And so there's an old school British seal to the classes, there's a historically kind of a call and response teaching methodology in these very big classes with like 100 students. Um, what used to be true until just a few years ago is that schools taught only in English, not in the local language. Students would often show up in grade one not knowing any English into a classroom where the teacher starts talking English about them, at them and you kind of hope that they pick it up somehow. Um, Uganda passed a law a few years ago saying that instruction should start out in the local language. 
as with many things, I guess, in Uganda, that law sometimes happens and sometimes doesn't happen. Uh, so based on the classroom observations from the project, there's still a fair amount of teaching in English, even though ostensibly both the treated classrooms and the controlled classrooms are supposed to be taught in the local language. Part of this intervention that we're going to study is definitely teaching in the local language in the first three grades. I will show you a picture in a second that will illustrate that there is limited physical capital in these schools. Teachers are less trained than you might expect in a developed country. They are trained. They have to take certain classes. They have to finish high school. They have to take some more years of school and beyond that. They have to pass some exams. But it's less training than you would expect in a developed country. And some of the teachers, if you give them tests, don't seem to know everything you might want them to know. At the same time, these teaching jobs are to some extent good jobs. Right? They're government jobs, hard to be fired, nice wages, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of mobility. We're thinking about writing a paper about this, actually. There is a fair amount of teachers changing the grades they teach. That was surprising to me because in a US context, there's a big fixed cost to teaching fourth grade instead of second grade. Um, Excuse me, and so people don't do it very often. There's also changing of teachers and schools more in Uganda than you might expect in a US context. Part of that is that there's a law that the teachers switch schools every five years. Like the law about teaching in English, that law is only partially enforced, but there is a fair amount of movement among schools. Teacher absences are an issue, like in India. We unfortunately don't have a lot of data on teacher attendance. We are trying sort of ex post to learn what we can learn about teacher attendance. It would be nice to know if teacher attendance is a mediator behind the value added distribution that we're going to find. There's sort of a different meaning to some teachers have high value added and some have low value added. If all that variation just reflects the number of days they spend in the classroom, versus whether that variation affects their own knowledge or their own skill at teaching. Right? If it's just that they're absent, you probably don't want to fire them. You probably want to find a way to get them to show up. If it's that they're a bad teacher when they, and they show up and still can't raise value added, you probably want to let them go. Right? So we would really like to know the role of absences as a mediator. Now this stunned me when I first saw this number. So annual per pupil spending in Uganda is about 55 US dollars. So a high spending US district spends about $18,000 per student per year. So my economist brain says margins are not being equated here. <laughs> yes, no, I completely get that. Um, yeah, this, this just astounded me, I have to say. All right, there's the promised picture. That is a, one of the schools from our study. So notice there are no lights, all right? There's no clock. There are windows, there are seats, there is a chalkboard of sorts. The seats are not comfortable. There's no place to put something to write on. Well, I guess there's a little place to put something to write on. This is actually a pretty decent school though for a primary school. Yeah, okay. It has seats. It has seats, all right. <laughs> Jess knows more about the distribution than I do. All right, so the intervention whose data we are relying on for this project is called the Northern Uganda Literacy Project, or NOLP. And it is the brainchild, the intervention, as opposed to the evaluation, is the brainchild was developed by a non-governmental organization called Mango Tree, which is an educational firm in Uganda. So, the experimental evaluation of the NULP intervention includes three arms. There are three arms because we're interested in scaling. Right? We talked a little bit about scaling earlier. It's all very well to show that a fancy program run by experts at an NGO can accomplish something. 
We also care about what happens when the government tries to do the same thing with fewer resources and their own staff. And so there's a full cost version of the program, which is administered by Mango Tree. It includes local language instruction, detailed lesson plans and scripts, monitoring by Mango Tree staff, and there's a lot of this. The Mango Tree staff go visit the teachers several times a year. They run weekend workshops for the teachers to get them excited about doing NULP and to make sure that they are up to date on how to do it. It includes some physical capital, so primers, readers, and slates, as well as plots. <coughs> it's a reasonably expensive treatment by the standards of $50, $55 per student per year. It is an, a composite treatment, right? So if I were a structural guy, and I wanted to know about the details of the education production function, I would be frustrated because what I get are three mixes of inputs instead of variation in any single input. Right? Now, you can imagine, if you had a lot more money and a lot more schools, trying to cross-randomize some of the aspects of this intervention to try to get at complementarities between different aspects of the treatment. We are not doing that. The middle arm, right, there's a control arm. The middle arm is supposed to represent what the government would do if the government was going to run this intervention. So it's like this, except no slates. Turns out slates are pretty expensive in Uganda. It also turns out that the government gave school slates like five years ago, but they're all gone. Right, so slates don't last long either, apparently. And the other expensive part is the mango tree personnel who were doing the training and the monitoring. And so in the low-cost arm, the mango tree personnel are replaced by government people. Right? And they use this cascade model of training where mango tree trains the first round of people who work for the government, and then they go and train down the line instead of mango tree doing all the training. That's cheaper because mango tree staff are expensive and because I think we don't worry enough about the opportunity cost of both the government workers. Though perhaps whatever they would do instead would actually be value reducing, so who knows. So there's a whole paper by the same set of authors now about scaling up that I can send to you if you're very interested. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty of the experiment. There's a long paper by uh, Jason and Rebecca, who finally has her N here, <laughs> uh, that goes into great detail about the intervention and the data collection. There's a lot of complications. As Jess mentioned in her talk, a lot of those details need to be in your head and in your paper, but not in your slides. So that's where they are. Basically, most of the years there are 128 schools that were randomly assigned in a stratified design to the three arms. And in most of the years, we're looking at primary grade one, primary grade two, and primary grade three. Students were randomly assigned to teachers at all the schools in 2013, and most of the schools in 2016 and 2017. Our outcome variable, is a test developed by education researchers that's called the EGRA, the Early Grade Reading Assessment. And education researchers, on whom we are relying here, have developed and validated a version of this exam in Lublengo, which is the local language in northern Uganda. So we are taking six aspects of this test related to literacy normalizing them, and then taking the first principal component. So we're getting a one-dimensional measure of literacy that is based on the common component of the variance in six individual measures of literacy. Trying to avoid multiple comparisons issues here, keep things conceptually simple. Yeah, there's also some writing outcomes that we haven't looked at for this paper yet but that are looked at in other papers. 
So we're going to be estimating the effects of teachers on this, on this ECRA literacy score. Now, if we were going to do a cost-benefit analysis, a full one, we would want to figure out the link between EGRA scores in grades one, two, and three and earnings 15 or 20 years later. That's hard. But people have done things like that in the US literature. And uh, we're not going to do that here, but that is what you'd like to have. Because for us, we're thinking about these test scores as a sort of mediating variable on the way to the things that we really care about, which are life outcomes. So we have school cross years cross no, school cross years cross classrooms. All of those things together are our full sample. There are school cross year cross classroom cross teachers, right? So we can only estimate teacher effects for teachers that we observe for at least two years. And so we have a bunch of one-off observations of teachers who only appear in the data for one year. Now there's several reasons why that might be true. They might be new teachers who started the last year of the data. They might be teachers who retire or leave teaching or go to another school or go to another grade other than P1 through P3. So that's where this point about lots of grades changing comes in. We have teachers who teach in P2 in one year, then teach in P4 and are outside the data, then come back and teach in P2. I know, it's crazy. No, I miss, I'm thinking of a different question, which is okay. don't you actually need the teacher to teach the same grade in at least two years? No, because we're standardizing everything. Mm -hmm. You're not happy with that? No, because, so, as, as you and I have talked about, uh, I think it's hard to compare standardized P1, where students are really unfamiliar with, with testing, and where the, uh, the variance, in, where a score of zero may mean something very different relative to ability. Um, but also because the, uh, the, the continuation probabilities are different after P3 versus after P1 for students. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I guess I'd at least like to know what happens if you limit to the subsample of, student, of teachers who have taught the same grade repeatedly. Do you get different measures of value at it? Yeah. Question. Uh, the, uh, the students assigned to the teachers at uh, the first year, did they follow through the same teacher or just reassign at the point? They're reassigned in the second year. Okay. In the third year. But isn't there a consideration for, for education being a continuous process and the students, you know, complying you know, learning the way of the, the teachers? Methods and there is a wonderful paper in the U.S. literature by a guy called Josh Kinsler. Uh, that looks at these sort of intertemporal complementarities between having, like, having a high value added teacher in a string of years instead of just having one high value added teacher and then a low value added teacher. We have not, our data are not really up to that here. We just don't have enough sample. It is certainly worth looking at, and I recommend the Kinsler paper if you're interested in sort of conceptually how to think about that. The vast majority of the literature implicitly treats each year as kind of independent and additive. Um, I think you're right to worry about that. And I think Kinsler's paper would convince you that you were right to worry about that. But we're not going to address that here. That's a good question. Let me go back to. What, and just I, Here's a lower tech reason that I'm worried about okay. looking at teachers who switch grades, which is just that if there are costs associated with teaching a new curriculum, then, then teachers might mechanically have lower value added when you're comparing their performance, you know, in a year in which they taught P2 mm -hmm. to a year in which they taught P1. If the reason that, you know, if, if the second year, if either of those is the first year of teaching, mm -hmm. therefore they're less effective. Let me say one more worrisome thing, <laughs> and then I want to say a little bit more about your comment. 
So it is also true that in the first year of the evaluation, they asked schools to assign the best teachers to these grades as determined by the head teacher. Now, in education land, there is a distinction between efficacy and effectiveness trials, which I was not familiar with until I started doing consulting in education land. So efficacy means, does the treatment work under ideal conditions? Effectiveness means, does the treatment work as it's normally implemented? And so if you, what you think of as, if you think of this experiment as an efficacy trial, then it makes sense to have the head teachers assign the best teachers to the grades that are going to be in the experiment. If you want to think about this as an effectiveness exercise, then you're unhappy having the best teachers assigned to these grades because that's not how the school normally works. Right? So, now another question, before you worry too much about that, is whether the head teachers have any idea of who the good teachers are. And the US literature thinks that they know the tales. Whether that result carries over to Uganda, I don't know. Now coming back to Jess's point, I, I want to, uh, I like the point about the learning the different grades. The other point, or one other point, has to do with the fact that the baseline test scores in the fall, of the, or the, not the fall, but at the beginning of P1, for many students equals zero, right? Which is to say that they don't get any questions right on the exam. They don't know any letters, they don't know any words, they know nothing by that measure. Now, one can worry about that for two reasons. One reason is, this may be the first time the students have ever taken a standardized test, right? And so, you may be getting measurement error for that reason, and it may be non-classical measurement error, which is to say it may be systematically downward biased in this context, that students are not answering any questions correctly, not because they don't know any letters, but because they don't know how to take a standardized test. I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. The second point, which I'm also sympathetic to, is that you can think about the thing you're really trying to measure, right, as a sort of latent skill level. And at that point, at the beginning of P1, your test instrument is doing a really bad job of capturing the latent skill level because it's coding everybody to this mass point at zero when probably there's a lot of heterogeneity there in terms of how close they are to knowing some letters and some words. So Jess suggested to me when we were talking about this during one of the breaks that we should do a sensitivity analysis that leaves out P1. Because this is where the mass point at zero is really important. There are still zeros in P2. But then there are probably real zeros. Then there are probably real zeros. But there still could be variation below zero. Uh, so I've made a note of that. But I thought that was a really good comment. And it was a comment I have not heard in the four times that I have presented the paper before. And pedagogically, Jeff is doing something smart here. So he's telling us up front what are the advantages of this research design, but also what are the limitations. And that's a smart thing to do because it means that when we move into the analysis, we'll understand why he's making the choices that he is, but also we won't feel we won't attack his results for things that he can't do given the limitations of the data and the design. Right, so it's a smart thing. Sometimes students think you don't want to highlight the problems with your research design. You only want to talk about what makes it great. But you need to be transparent and realistic with your audience about the, and not just with an experiment, but any research design. What are the important limitations that affect the choices you make going forward. It's not just students who think that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, I have had colleagues who feel that you should make your paper sound as positive as it possibly can, subject to not outright lying. And I am not a fan of writing papers that way. Um, 
that, you know, there's a view that it's kind of the reader's job to sort it out, and you don't have to help them. Uh, to me, that's not helping the scientific enterprise. Uh, I think there is great value to developing a reputation in research for being bluntly honest about the work. And I also think, and this is a different aspect of your comment that I mentioned in my earlier talk, that it's really important not to announce, but to justify the design decisions that you make. And that's just as important in an empirical study like this one as it is in a theoretical study where you might be making functional form assumptions or other kinds of modeling assumptions whose implications may be small but may also be large that you want to say, here's why I'm doing this and here's what the implication of it is. All right, we're also going to pay attention to the subsample with the randomly assigned students to the teachers and then within that, the subsample where we have teachers for at least two years. So this is the equation that we estimate. Let me tell you about this notation. So our dependent variable here is an end of year test score for student I and cohort C and grade G and year T. That's gonna be equal to an intercept, the leg test score, all right, so the same test, but minus one, so the beginning of the year rather than the end of the year. Some student level covariates here. Because we have random assignment of students to teachers, the role of the student covariates here is not to reduce bias. The role of the covariates is to consume residual variation and make our estimates more precise. This is the object of interest gamma sub CGT. So that is an intercept for each classroom, grade, and time. After we've conditioned on the X's, the leg test scores, a grade fixed effect, a time period fixed effect, and we've allowed the effect of the leg test score to vary with the grade level. Another way to do these models is to move this over here, to do this as a first differences model. There should be a slide about that, actually. <laughs> While Jeff makes that note, this is exactly how you should present this sort of a slide, right? So he put the equation up, he explained it, there's enough information on the slide that you can look at it and figure out what's going on. And he doesn't just include the notation, he includes one of the, so this is a comment that people are gonna make all the time unless you write it down. Why didn't you include school fixed effects? And so he's written it down, we know, you know, he anticipated that and he's put it up there. So this slide makes really clear what he's doing and he walked through it, told us which is the most important coefficient, that's exactly how to present this slide in your paper. Although I forgot to have a line explicitly defining gamma C. That's true. That should be on here too. Other questions about what we're estimating? So this is a standard formulation in the literature. This is a van. Does everybody know what classroom means as opposed to teacher? A classroom is a room full of students in a particular year, right? So we're going to estimate the change in the student performance on this test from the beginning of the year to the end of the year for the students who sat in a particular classroom. That's going to give us a bunch of gamma hat CGTs. When we go to estimate the teacher effects, what we're going to do is, for teachers with at least two observations in the data, we're going to take the average of their gamma hat CGTs. So that's the, the uh, persistent component, if you will, of the value added in that teacher's classroom. And ask, so that's an example of a question where if you don't understand, where something that is the unit of analysis, right? You should ask that because otherwise it makes it hard to follow the empirical work. 
for the rest of for the rest of the talk. That's a kind of a clarifying question that's always welcome. It's you're not nitpicking, you're not trying to score points against the presenter. You're just trying to understand. So you should ask that kind of a question. Yeah, and the presenter wants you to understand. Now there another question you might ask in response to that. So I just referred to this average of gamma CGT hats as estimating the persistent effect of the teacher. There is some literature in the US where you've got lots and lots of periods on the same teachers that looks at how stable that persistent effect is. Right? So you can imagine a model where a teacher's value added, that the true underlying structural value added, is actually changing gently over time. Right? So there may be learning by doing at the beginning of the career. There may be skill atrophy at the end of the career. People have looked at that by allowing there to be sort of a persistent, like a, a long frequency component and a short frequency component. Because there's going to be period by period effects, right? Some years the teacher may be busy getting divorced, so their value added goes down. Some years you may have an exceptional class that you really like, so you put an extra effort, value added goes up, right? There's going to be transitory, but there also may be some systematic sort of structural variation of the underlying value added. We can't get at that here. We don't have enough periods. People have looked at it in the US. It is relatively stable, but not completely stable. Yes? Okay. Is it gamma uh, with uh, software CGT? Is yeah. that fixed effect of classroom grade and year? Yeah. But if you have that fixed effect, why do you also add grade fixed effect and time fixed Because we were trying to reduce residual variation, and we might, and you can also think about the grade fixed effects as getting a little bit at Jess's concern about our ability to compare the test score across grades on the egg graph, right? So maybe everybody in P2 has a bigger gain on the EGRA than everybody in P1 for whatever reason. And this nets that out. That makes our estimates more precise. So this That's is, a good question. So, the, so it's allowing for a different average test score in different grades. That's a better way to put it, actually. And in different years, because there may be a great shock. Maybe everybody's distracted by the presidential election in Uganda or something. Right. Other questions? This is key, right? This is, as Jess was saying, right, that the sort of the heart of an empirical paper is typically the identification and estimation strategy. This is the first of the slides about that, and this is the key one for what we're up to. All right, I already talked about that. So another issue concerns sorting of teachers to school. Right? And I want you to think about two extreme cases. So one extreme case is that teachers are randomly assigned to schools, or effectively randomly assigned to schools, right? In some non-random way that's not related to teacher value added. An alternative scheme, and I have not written this down quite correctly, an alternative scheme is that teachers are perfectly sorted to school based on their value added, right? So the best teachers all go to one school, the next best set of teachers go to the next school, the next best set of teachers go to the next school, but the, the, the worst teachers all go to the same school. We are concerned that there are school level factors that also affect value added, right? The, the head teacher or principal in the US terminology is one obvious case. An effective principal might increase the value added of all the teachers at the school. But you want to attribute that value added increment not to the teachers, but to the school, right? To the principal. It may be that there are differences in physical capital across schools that affect value added. So you would like to net out school effects. The problem is that if we're in the world where teachers are sorted to schools based on their value added, if we look only at within school variation in teacher value added, then we understate 
perhaps substantially so, the amount of value added among teachers. Right? In the extreme case of perfect sorting, if we look only within schools, we could get zero estimated variance in teacher value added, even though the actual teacher value added is quite large. On the other hand, if we have approximately random assignment of teachers to schools, then taking within school variation in teacher quality should give us the same answer as we would get from using the between school and the within school variation. So we're going to use only the within school variation. We're going to rescale the teacher fixed effects by subtracting off the mean of the teacher fixed effects in their school. Okay. So we're going to interpret that as a lower bound. Right. In the world of random assignment of teachers to schools, it is both a lower bound and the right answer. In a world where teachers are sorted to schools based on their value added, it is a lower bound and the truth is away from the bound. Now this, is, this comes up in this whole literature because people are usually taking out these school fixed effects and then telling an institutional story about how in a particular substantive context teachers are assigned to schools. In Uganda, teachers are assigned to schools by the center, right, at the, at the, in the capital. And as best we can tell, it is some, they're not trying to do it based on value added, let's put it that way. Uh, and then of course, you would have to say, do they know value added anyway? I'm going to show you the variances with and without removing the school level component. So with and without subtracting off the school mean, the difference between those two variances provides an estimate of the extent of sorting of teachers to schools based on value added. Right? If when we take the within school variance only and the estimate doesn't change very much, then we're in here. If it changes a lot, then we're closer to here. All right, probably many of you know this econometric point that is important in this literature. So when you take a bunch of observations and you take a mean, then all the little shocks, positive and negative, relative to the mean cancel out. Right? So that's why the variance of the mean is sigma squared over root n, where sigma squared is the variance of the individual observations. The more observations you have, the more cancellation occurs in the idiosyncratic components, and so the closer you get to the truth. That doesn't happen when you square things, right? We're going to be looking at the variance of teacher value added. So each estimate, right, each gamma hat is a true gamma plus an error, right? And so the variance of gamma hat is the variance of the truth plus the variance of the error if they're independent. These things are all positive, they're variances, right? So we know that the variance of gamma hat is an upward biased estimate of the variance of gamma, where the extent of the bias depends on the variance of the error, which in turn de de depends on the number of students that we used to compute the gamma hat, right? It, it depends on the residual so let me make two points at this point. One is that Jeff has not explicitly presented a literature review. So he's talked about the, uh, the, the papers that specifically estimate value-added models in developing countries, but otherwise not presented a literature review. I'm guessing that that is in part because there is a very large, very contentious literature <laughs> about value added, especially in the United States, much of which is relevant to what he's doing only because it uses the same object. It estimates value added scores, uh, value added measures. It gets into the details of how to calculate them. But then the policy, the what do you do with it, is going to be pretty different in the US than other places. So I'm not going to quibble too much with that choice here, but I just want to point out that that's something that Jeff gets to do 
in part based on his seniority in, <laughs> in the profession, and in part based on, on the particulars of this literature, that, that this is a literature where people bite each other's heads off uh, for fun. <laughs> and it, but it's not, this is one of these things where I said stick to the formula initially, and then you can innovate. This is innovating. Uh, the second bit that I want to point out at this point is the use of the board can be a very powerful strategy in a seminar because it is a way of adapting your presentation to the audience. It's also a way of demonstrating that you know more than you wrote down. You understand what's going on behind your slides and you're able to explain that to the audience when it's useful. I would make uh Two remarks in response to that. Yes, I agree with all you said. So I'm also allowed not to use tech because of my seniority in the profession, right? So you will see uh, these are word slides. Uh, if you're really, really senior, so we have Tom Sargent come through Michigan to give a named lecture, a very famous lecture called the Wojtynski Lecture that people have been giving for 30 years now. And some of these lectures have been published and so on. Tom Sargent had no slides at all, right? He just got up and paced back and forth and gave his talk. No slides whatsoever, right? That's a higher level than me. <laughs> so, or if you're Mr. Heckman, you have 400 slides for your <laughs> 90 and minute talk. And somebody else made them. <laughs> and somebody else made them for you, yes. Uh, in the old days, that was me. All right. Um, yeah, so there is a methodology that has been developed in the literature. It's called a shrinkage estimator, or an empirical Bayes estimator, for those of you into such things. There is a methodology in the literature where you can figure out what this is, and thus recover this, given that you have this. Right? And so we are going to do that. We're going to follow the method in this QJ paper here, if that would work. The second point I want to make in response to Justin's comment is that I am going to compare our estimates. I thought you were going to say initially that I haven't presented the estimates yet. <laughs> I didn't do the foreshadowing that you wanted me to do. Uh, and I tell students not to do that. I agree with you. That uh, this is not an O. Henry novel. Henry is a famous American author of short stories with surprise endings. And your paper should not be a short story with a surprise ending. <laughs> um, when I present the estimates, the literature review is in a sense going to come in, that aspect of it is going to come in at that point when I put the estimates in context by referring to the other developing country studies as well as a couple of US papers. Uh, but you're right, the rest of this is just the methods that I'm drawing from, the, from primarily the US literature, which, yeah, it's Rothstein again, <laughs> name following. But we like it. All right. In terms of this question of whether or not you use, need to use LaTeX, honestly, I would say <laughs> at this stage in your career, just learn to use it. It's easier. Uh, it's great for actually writing the paper. In, in terms of the presentation, if it's well formatted, it doesn't matter whether it's LaTeX or not. But it is easier to pr produce some of the notation in tech than it is in other things. But what, can you go back to your slide with the specification? So what we care about is that you write this out clearly. And if you can do that in Word, fine, right? But what's important is that the notation helps us understand rather than distracts us. So this is uh, done with a package called MathType. That is an add-on to Word that you buy separately and integrates with Word. Word now has its own built-in math, which I don't think is as pretty. Uh, tech math is very pretty, no question about that. Um, if you ever want to really irritate a computer scientist, you just tell them that you thought Donald Knuth would have done the world a favor by working on something else besides tech. <laughs> uh, Donald Knuth is probably the most famous computer scientist of the 20th century. 
He's the guy that came up with tech, consumed several years of his research career. You don't know. Very pretty. Very pretty. Uh, okay. So, some numbers. So, I'm also violating Jess's dictum about tables. So, I have these pretty pictures that were created by Jason that I figured out how to integrate into my Word file at the Detroit airport before <laughs> my plane took off. Uh, so, this is standard deviation units in that index that we created from the EGRA. So it is standard, pun intended, in the education literature to look at effects in terms of standard deviations of test scores. And the reason is that test scores usually by themselves don't have a lot of absolute meaning. If I tell you that you know, this is number of correct questions and it goes from five to 10, well, if I don't tell you how hard the questions are, that doesn't mean a lot. Five easy questions is very different than 10 easy questions or five hard questions or whatever. And so people typically convert the test scores into standard deviation units keyed off of the untreated units if you're doing some sort of evaluation. So that's what we've done here. So if you look at the raw gamma hats, their variance without adjustment for this issue here is about 0.5 standard deviations. Now I'm going to give you some context in a second of what numbers are for other developed country contexts and for the US. If we look only at the within school variation, right, so we subtract off the school mean from all the gamma hats, that falls to about 0.4. So that tells you there is some sorting of teachers to schools based on value added because the within school variation is less than the overall variation that combines within and between school. When we apply the correction to get rid of the error variance here, we fall down to about 0.3. Two, three, three, something like that. This is why you should have a table. Uh, so this matters, but not gigantically so. I think it's fair to say. Then we can find ourselves to only gamma hats for teachers who are in the sample for at least two years and with the teacher effects. Get another reduction. So that's telling us that the gamma hats for the one-offs, for the teachers who only appear once, are a bit higher variance than for the ones who appear more often. And then we can find ourselves only to the teacher effects based on years and schools where we did random assignment of students to teachers. And again, it falls now from about 0 0.18 to 0.12 or something like that. So there's some sorting of students to teachers that we needed to worry about. So we were right to want to do random assignment in this institutional context. What's a standard deviation of just the outcome variable? Wait, I'm not sure what you mean by that So question. what's the standard deviation of y? What is the standard deviation of y? That is a good question that I should know the answer to or do not. That's a reasonable way yeah. to answer a question. Like, if you don't know, don't bluff. Right. No, no, never bluff. Don't. Uh... That's the right way to answer that question. Does anybody know why I'm asking? No. I'm just trying to think about the magnitudes, and I'm also trying to think about the fact that you have a bunch of zeros in that y, right? So then, does the standard deviation of the outcome look high because we've got a whole bunch of zeros in there? Actually, in, in, in the first year, it's probably low because you have a whole bunch yeah. of zeros in there. So it'd be, it would be helpful to me to see the standard deviation of the outcome by grade. That would be good to have. It is, it is big in a substantive sense, but yeah. I can't give you a number. Yeah. All right, so I know, for example, that by the time you get to grade three, there are still students at zero. But there are also students who have done really well. And so yeah. the span is, that's another paper we're doing off of this data set 
is called Some Children Left Behind. <laughs> so in the US, that is a pun, because there is a very important policy called No Child Left Behind. And so this paper will be called Some Children Left Behind, because in fact, what this even in the, the full cost treatment arm, some children don't appear to learn anything, right? And so they are left behind, even in this very effective treatment. And we want to try to get it, why is that? Or at least to quantify how much of that is there. But there's a lot of ways to think about kind of how big is an effect, right? Do we think something is a big effect or a small effect? And one way is to compare to the effects of other interventions or value added in other contexts. But another way is just to say, well, how big is it relative to the variation that exists between different students who are heterogeneous for, for many different reasons? So is the teacher, is the effect of a teacher like going from the 10th percentile student to the 50th percentile student, or is it like going from the 10th percentile student to the 12th percentile student? is another way to think about scaling effects. <laughs> OK. Uh, we also, there's this paper by this person who was on the job market a couple of years ago, a student of the aforementioned Jesse Rothstein, uh, called Hedvig Horvath. And she advocates testing each school year to see if it looks like the students were randomly assigned or not. And in most of our non-randomly assigned classrooms, we can't reject the null that the students in the different classrooms have the same distributions of observed characteristics, which is consistent with a modest effect of comparing the randomly assigned classrooms to all the classrooms. And in previous versions, we actually had a set of estimates that used all the classrooms that passed the test which included most of the random assignment classrooms and some of the others. Okay. Is that also consistent with just the test score measures being really noisy? Yes, I think that's And can true. you check for that by looking at the within the student correlation of test scores over time? That would be good to know. So in general, I'm asking questions that help us interpret the information that Jeff is giving us, right? The goal of the question is to think about how to interpret what he's telling us. So I gave this paper in Berlin last week. I've been in a lot of time zones in the last 10 days uh, in front of my uh, colleague and co-author my, my co and good friend Dan Black. And one of his comments was, which nests the question that Jess just asked, you should really know the psychometric properties of the EGRA. And uh, that is on the to-do list. OK, so here are the promised comparisons. You can think about this as part of the literature survey. All right, so again, standard deviation of teacher effects. This is the famous Chetty paper, right, where they linked up the data from Project STAR, which was an experimental evaluation of class size variation in the US. This is the Ecuador paper, whose methodology we have borrowed in part. This is our paper. And these are India and Pakistan. These are the two papers that did not do random assignment of student to teachers. So Uganda is bigger. Remember, these are all lower bounds because they're always taking out variation at the school level and looking at only within school variation. And I, would, I don't know about Ecuador, but in the US, I think there is non-trivial sorting of teachers to schools by value added. You know, half full, half empty. My prior, and another way to do this presentation would be to frame it around my prior. My prior was that we'd be here. Uh, because Rebecca was telling me all these stories about how teacher training works. And <laughs> about the qualifications of the teachers and the heterogeneity and their skills and ability and attendance and so on, I thought the variation, even the lower bound, 85, would be much, much higher than the corresponding figure for the US. So for me, the difference this paper made to my beliefs was, oh, Uganda's not as different from the US as I thought on this dimension. This is another way of thinking about the magnitude of these estimates. So this is 
the effect of moving from the 10th percentile of the distribution of teacher value added to the 90th, based on our estimates. So that's over half a standard deviation. In education land, 0.2 standard deviations is considered a really killer intervention, like a really strong intervention that you would care about and like. This is the effect of the full cost treatment. This is huge, by the way, right? 0.6 standard deviation. But it's comparable to going from a really bad to a really good teacher, based on our estimates. McEwen 2015 is a survey of educational interventions in developing countries. The 90th percentile of the interventions that he surveyed have, has an impact of about 0.2 standard deviations. The mean intervention that he surveys is at about 0.1 standard deviations. So this says that teachers are very powerful in the Ugandan context. And this is a lower bound on the variance of the teacher fixed effects. Right? So teachers matter a lot in Uganda. Right? They matter as much as an extreme outlier among educational interventions. That too is like the US. Right? But, but, the, but you're making this comparison using the same test score measures. So yeah. this isn't about teachers or the intervention. It's about sort of some characteristic of the test. Then <clears throat> yeah, in particular, okay. this test so we just got so lucky and yeah. picked a test that induced a high variance of value added. Well, in a, a test that has lots of zeros. Yeah. Fair enough. And where we think that it, you know, where like progress is kind of cheap. And it's easy. To okay. Yeah. Okay, and one other point of reference. So Hanischek and Rivkin have a survey of US literature, so going beyond just the Chetty paper, and their range of estimates uh, is 0.11 to 0.26 standard deviations for the variance of the teacher fixed effect. So our, our estimate is in there. So again, surprisingly, not that different than the US. Okay, since my time is short, Valerie is watching. <laughs> Big sister. <laughs> uh, but there's just a couple things left to do. And so one of them is to look at the correlation between our estimates of teacher value added and observed characteristics of teachers. So the US literature has looked at this, right? This is kind of a holy grail, right? If there were some simple thing that you could observe about teachers that would tell you they were going to be a good teacher, boy, would that be great. Right? For hiring teachers, for assigning teachers. What the US literature says is that except for experience, teachers seem to be worse their first three years. And participation in a program called Teach for America, you can't predict teacher value adding. Women aren't better than men. People who go to posh schools aren't a little tiny bit better than people who go to non-posh schools for their undergraduate degrees. High ability teachers are a little bit better at math and science, but not a lot. Maybe there's just not a lot there. Maybe we could do better in a developing country context if we think the teachers are more heterogeneous in their backgrounds and so on. So here's a table. Note the R squares. Okay. So this is the teacher effects. We have years of schooling, salary. That's not necessarily what I would put in. Male experience. And this is an IQ score of teachers, right? So these are real zeros, right? These are precisely estimated zeros that explain 2.5% of the variation in the estimates of teacher value added. So this is another place where you bond to parallels the developed country literature you can't predict teacher value added. That's too bad. I'll be very quick on this. We correlated the value added measures with stuff that teachers are observed to do in classrooms. More effective teachers have more structured lessons and more active students. Which way does the causality run there? I don't know, but maybe that's interesting. That's something we need to think more about and we can discuss at the break. 
Finally, let me spend a couple minutes on what I think is one of the very interesting aspects of the paper, but which is also quick, which is to present the impact of the intervention, the NULP, and its three versions, well, it's two versions plus control, on the distribution of teacher value added. So first, I'm going to present the experimental mean impact estimates. Then I'm going to present impacts on the distribution of value added. These are the mean impacts in experiment. What you can see is, now this is the level, right? So the, the impacts are differences in these bars. And this is control, reduced cost, and full cost. So I'll save you reading that whole paper about scale up. The full cost version works a lot better. Uh, and perhaps enough to justify its additional cost in a sort of back of the envelope way. Here are the densities of the estimated teacher fixed effects in the three arms. Now, if I want to be careful, if there were standard errors on these things, there's not a huge number of teachers here. But looking at the point estimates, so here's the control distribution. Here is the low cost arm, the green with the long dashes. And here is the full cost arm, the red with the little short dashes. What you see is that, as you'd expect from the means, as you do a more intensive intervention, the distribution of teacher fixed effects moves over to the right. So teachers, on average, get better at teaching. What is also true, though, is that the distribution spreads out. Right? So some children are left behind. It seems that some teachers are left behind as well by this intervention. Now, a natural thing to do in thinking about this is to think about rank preservation. To think that the teachers maintain their ranks, in some sense, in the different treatment arms. So that the best teacher in the full cost arm would be the best teacher, and the partial arm would be the best teacher in the control arm. The literature calls that rank preservation. That doesn't have to be true, right? These are marginal distributions. Rank preservation is a claim about the joint distribution of your teacher fixed effect in these different arms. There is a test in the literature of an implication of rank preservation. We do that test. We reject the null. But the substantive departure from rank preservation is not large. And we, our prior, our intuition, if you will, is that probably it's roughly true. <coughs> We would love to know the extent to which this spreading out is mediated by treatment effects on teacher attendance. We are trying to dig into the data, right? It could be that all this intervention does is it makes teaching more interesting, and so some teachers show up more often, right? And their value added gets bigger. I don't think that's all of it, but it might be some of it. It would be really nice to know that we are trying. Similarly, student attendance may be a mediator. That this teaching style with the slates and with the pre-written lessons, the scripts, may be a more interesting classroom experience or one that students perceive as being more valuable. We're trying to track that down too. Another concern that I have, and the next slide is the last one, is the extent to which this variance spread is permanent or transitory. Right? So another story you could tell is that if we looked five years in the future, that this tail would have moved over because some teachers are taking a long time to learn how to do NULP, and some teachers catch on to NULP right away. So NULP is a very different way of teaching than these teachers have been doing before. It's not call and response. It's not in English. It involves slates. It involves new physical capital, premiers and readers. Maybe it takes some teachers a while. And what we're getting here is teachers just one or two years into the treatment. So I don't know. Now, a sensitivity analysis we could do there would be to compare new teachers to old teachers. Why? Because new teachers haven't been corrupted by the old teaching method, so they should catch on right away. We haven't done that sensitivity analysis. All right. Um, summary conclusion. 
So, the very first, you can tell people next time you're at a party, I saw the first value added estimate for Africa. And they will excuse themselves and go get something to drink. <laughs> uh, the shrinkage mattered, sorting of students to teachers matters a bit, sorting of teachers to schools matters a bit. None of those were as dramatic as I was expecting. Perhaps surprisingly, surprisingly to me, our ballpark estimates of the variance of teacher value added are within the range that you would expect for the US and are substantively very meaningful. So teachers matter in Uganda, but there's no way to pick out the ones that are good based on their observed characteristics, just like in the US. Any final questions before we? Thanks. All right, thank you.